So welcome to the public policy session. Mike Wassenaar, President, Alliance for Community Media. Mike um, pretty much leads seminars and lectures all over the country talking about public policy issues, community media-based um, organizations throughout the whole United States. He's made presentations in front of Congress, the FCC, and other national and regional member organizations. So he originally was the, or during this time, he was um, also the executive director at St. Paul Neighborhood Network. So that's kind of how I know Mike. Mm -hmm. um, and then he worked really closely with AmeriCorps groups at that time. And it was probably four years ago that you were the president. I became president four years ago. Of the ACM. That's right. And I cannot stress how fortunate we are to have Mike in our ball court. Um, because he has helped us with template letters and making the right highlights and testimonials and all this. And so public policy for us is extremely important because as much as we want to assume we're running a TV station, there's more to it than that. And he really helps this all kind of come together. So this is Mike Wassenaar. Thank you, Alicia. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I, I'm just going to use this microphone for, for Otto, Otto's benefit here. Um, as you can tell, um, uh, I've got this sort of booming voice, so if you can't hear me in the back of the room, something's wrong. So <clears throat> if, you, if you need clarification at any point, just let me know, because I'll just, I'll just project for the room. Um, and Alicia's very kind to talk about you know, the public policy I work uh, at, at ACM. Um, just to let you know, I got started in this uh, line of work many, many years ago as a, as a youth media participant in high school. So it's kind of a special thing to be back in a high school uh, today, um, just you know, looking out and seeing the, uh, the display of uh, the media studies group there and thinking about uh, the opportunities that lie ahead for people here in Alliance. Uh, this, is, this is true, I think, for just about you know, all of your organizations that do any kind of uh, youth engagement work or community work. You're really kind of building, building folks for the future. Um, so just imagine that someone else will be doing a lecture in 40 years, like this one, okay? Um, the other thing I just want to tell you is that um, about half of my work is public policy. The other half is, is member outreach uh, with uh, folks doing uh, community media across the country and program development, helping people to develop different types of uh, structures, programs, ways to be able to make their missions live. Um, so that's actually, this, I see this as the necessary evil that I have to do in the world be able to do the fun stuff. I like doing the creative, the creative work that happens uh, on the ground in local communities every day. That's actually the thing that kind of makes me excited every morning. This stuff does not necessarily make, you, make me excited. It's like getting my flu shot every year. I have to be involved to make sure that I'm protecting the things that are actually useful happening on the ground uh, across the country. Um, so I, I'm just going to highlight a, a couple of current um, uh, administrative uh, actions that are happening at the FCC. We talk a little bit about Congress because Congress is doing not much, if not a little bit, right now. So there's a little bit you should know about Congress. Uh, probably some impacts for 2019 we'll talk about. Uh, and then there's a couple of court cases that are happening um, that you should know about, either to monitor or, or to be more than monitoring. I'll, I'll talk about that uh, during the course of the, of the, of the talk. Um, I've given a v version of this at a couple other conferences. Um, we've got an hour and 15 minutes set aside. I'll probably talk for, I'll talk for 45 minutes or, or so and we can just kind of have a general discussion after that. But at each one of these cases that we'll talk about um, or proceedings that we'll talk about, I want your questions. So we'll have time during each one for you to be able to ask me questions. If there's anything that's not clear about what's going on. All right, let's begin. All right, and that's, that's me. I'll have my contact information for you. And if you need a, a copy of the slide, I'm not sure, uh, Alicia, if Central States will be giving the slide decks out, but I can, I can, email, stu I can email stuff to everybody directly. And I want to be in contact with you. I, I'm already in, in contact with you and a number of you right now in terms of the legislative work that we're doing, um, which we'll, I'll be talking about here. But if you want to be involved, let me know. So let's start with something that doesn't ap appear to be about public educational and government television. Um, and that's uh, the third report in order that came out from the FCC in September, a uh, declaratory ruling on wireless infrastructure. That's the docket number if you want it, or the two, the two docket numbers. 
Um, you know, the, the current FCC, uh, led by uh, uh, Republican appointee uh, Chairman Ajit Pai, um, has a very uh, deregulatory stance for just about everything um, and sees its role as uh, getting government out of the way of, of the good things that it wants to promote. Um, so what I'm going to be describing for you in a couple of instances um, uh, may not make sense to you, uh, but uh, from the viewpoint of uh, the Pi administration, uh, it makes sense. Right? So uh, this order basically uh, limited uh, the amount of control that local government can have over the siting of wireless facilities. Um, it, basically, it basically limited the things that local governments could do when uh, small cell development particularly happens. Um, the motivation for this is uh, the move to 5, 5G that you probably have heard about, where the, the bandwidth is different, so therefore it doesn't travel as far. So the facilities, the physical facilities uh, in mesh networks actually have to be closer together for you to have ubiquity of coverage. What that's going to mean in communities that have that type of cell service, and I'm not convinced that every community in the United States is going to have that type of cell service. I think that's one of the things that's interesting about this order. It, it doesn't mandate rollout in rural communities. It doesn't mandate you know, rollout to poor communities or poorly served communities. It basically tells government to get out of the way uh, when it comes to, to cell tower siting. Um, those towers actually be closer together. And the reason why it's called small cell is not that the devices are small, it's that the, the cell coverage of the wireless, the wireless footprint is smaller, right? So imagine where in, you know, in your community you have maybe uh, 50 towers, you may have to have something on the order of 10 times as many towers. And the devices are going to be smaller, they're going to be mounted on light poles, other, other, other fixtures. In some cases, using private poles, in some cases, using public poles. Uh, the FCC actually wants to limit the ability for communities to be able to say where and how, where and how those facilities are, are, are placed. Um, they want also, particularly for us, I think it's important, they want to limit the compensation that wireless companies pay for the use of public rights of way. The FCC says that you can recover the direct cost of the installation of that facility. You can't charge a flat fee, like a franchise fee. You can't charge a per poll fee, like private operators do. Actually, the thing that's curious about this disorder is it, it doesn't speak at all about Private poll, op, private poll operators. It talks about public rights of way, and it controls costs of public rights of way because basically the FCC has a great deal of latitude over what it can say about what local governments can do. And it puts a shot clock for local governments to act on applications that come from the wireless industry. So the, the major impact you're gonna see on this is that this is gonna have a multi-billion dollar impact on local government's capacity to get revenue from the use of public rights of way for the foreseeable future for the use of wireless. Um, there's going to be a court appeal. Um, there have actually been court appeals filed by the city of San Jose, California, and something like 50 other cities. Um, there will be a court challenge that the cities, I think the U.S. Conference of Mayors, um, I believe the National League of Cities uh, will be a part of. Um, it's not clear what district court it will be in. Sprint is challenging this order, believe it or not, because they think it's not bad enough. Okay? They want to actually put in language that says something in the effect of if the city doesn't act within, by the time the shot clock's up, uh, up, license is deemed granted and they can put up whatever the hell they want. Okay? Uh, so it's going to be challenged by, the, by industry as well. Um, how does this affect PEG? Two ways. One, and both of them are indirect. One is the, the effect that it will have on city coffers long term, right? Because of the, the base, and, and probably also city resources. Meaning you can recover maybe the cost for applications and, and you know, uh, changing out poles or something like that, but you can't re recover franchise fees according to this order. 
Um, most importantly then, too, it, it creates the principle that you can use the public right-of-way without a franchise fee, which is enshrined in the Cable Act. We'll get, that's the, I'd call that the other shoe, okay? So that's, this is the first shoe. We have to deal with the other shoe, right? So this is one of the other shoes. Um, this is uh, the Streamline Act that was introduced by Senators Thune and Schatz from San Diego, of oh, San Diego, <laughs> I wish, South Dakota. South Dakota and Hawaii. I'm just thinking about beach t beaches there. Uh, that's why I thought San Diego and Hawaii. Um, South Dakota and Hawaii. Uh, uh, Senate Bill 3157. It was introduced earlier this year after a great deal of discussion in committee. Um, we and a lot of our allies had, were given the opportunity to see a draft of that bill. Uh, the bill codify, uh, codifies a lot of those principles that are in the administrative action and the wireless order into federal law, right? So it, it basically writes into law the things that the PI Commission is trying to do with administrative rulings. So far, there's been no hearings on this, and there are no co-sponsors of it, and it's n in no small part due to the uh, pressure that uh, the public has been putting forward on this. Actually, a number of you in the room have been involved in this in one way, shape, or form. So thank you for being involved. Also, our allies at the, with local cities have been involved. Basically, you say no to this bill because of that principle of the use of public rights of way at cost rather than a franchise fee or some reasonable market fee. That's the thing that's kind of crazy about these orders, is that they say, oh, the private industry can, can charge fair market value, but no fair, no fair market value available to the public for the use of public property. It, it's like they're saying, they're saying they're socializing public property for the use of private gain. That's literally, literally what they're doing. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why the city of San, San Jose was so incensed. Um, they actually came up with a franchise with Verizon uh, this last year, which uh, put several million, million dollars up front for digital education work with communities, communities of color, low-income communities in the city of San Jose, and then also mandated build-out within the entire city for those fast, fast networks. The, the Pi administration's uh, wireless order basically would, would make those illegal. So you couldn't serve an entire community you couldn't, you couldn't negotiate to serve an entire community. And then you couldn't, you couldn't actually pay for, pay for things like community media work, digital literacy instruction, those types of things that the city of San Jose was interested in. So because of the pressure from cities and organizations like ours, there have been no hearings or co-sponsors on this. And as a matter of fact, at one point, this bill had a, a codicil in it that said, um, the cable industry, since they're suffering so much, I was talking about this earlier today on the, on the radio, Comcast had $40 billion in free cash to buy Sky, Rupert Murdoch's European, European satellite service. In cash, right? I mean, so just, just to be clear, they're not making enough money as fast as they should, therefore they need to have a Me Too movement for the cable industry meaning they need relief from franchise fees. So there actually was, there was writing in the bill that would have said the franchise fees should be at cost or equal to what the wireless industry is getting. That got knocked out in no small part because of opposition of, of our organization and, and, and our, our allies. But our understanding is if this thing gets, is, gets introduced again in the next Congress, that will come back. It's like a zombie idea since we're just a couple of days from Halloween, it's zombie legislation, the idea that it won't stop, is the idea that the cable industry is suffering and has to compete with wireless, therefore it needs to have relief. Okay, so expect that there will be something next Congress on this. They may return. I had zombie idea in the original thing, but I, I cleaned it up, but just think about it as the walking dead. This is sort of like the, the other sort of uh, spooky thing we're dealing with right now. I'm just going to just kind of keep riffing on uh, 
riffing on Halloween here. Um, this is, uh, any questions so far, by the way? What was that P-R-O-W? Public rights of way. P uh, that's a public P-R-O-W, public rights of way. Okay, any questions going so far? This is, a, the, this is actually the, 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 the hottest, uh, the hottest administrative action right now that we're working with at ACM with our members and with our allies across the United States. Um, it's the uh, FCC's second further notice of proposed rulemaking, or FNPRM, on cable franchising. So that's, that's the docket number 05311 that was issued uh, in September at the same time as the wireless order. Um, I'll, I'll go through this a, a, a lot. I guess the thing you should know about this uh, bill is that it's directly related to court challenges that have occurred over the course of the last decade to an earlier order where the FCC said in-kind monies can be applied against franchise fees. And they never defined what in-kind was, <coughs> believe it or not. So like in-kind could be, and this notice specifically um, after a court had actually kicked out the earlier ruling in 2016 and found that the FCC had acted in an arbitrary and capricious manner, simply saying, oh, in-kind fees will be taken against franchise fees across the country. Um, the court said, no, you actually have to define what in-kind fees are. You can't just sort of make, make stuff up. I was going to say crap, but the court said something a little bit more genteel. You can't just make things up. So the FCC is taking them at their word. Um, they're proposing that in-kind has a definition. In-kind support has a definition. What is in-kind support under a cable franchise, according to the FCC? According to the FCC's proposed definition, it's any kind of obligation that's, that has material value. That is not money in the franchise fee or related to you know, peg capital that you may get in a, in a peg fee. Well, what is that? Could be anything at fair market value. And what they're proposing is a mechanism that says that a cable company can, can flag that amount and then deduct money against franchise fees automatically so that the local franchising authority never sees the franchise fee if there's something of value that's been given in the franchise. So what could that be? Well, it could be your facility, if it's, if it's operating support for the facility, separate from the peg capital. A lot of places co-locate with cable head ends across the country. You see a lot of places actually having free rent because of that co-location. That free rent suddenly has a monetary value and can be charged in this franchise fee. Uh, it could be promotional support that you receive on the channels. Uh, many places will get um, um, in-kind support with uh, free, uh, free PSA insertion. Well, free actually means we charge you, apparently. Okay? So that, that, that free benefit you got before suddenly has a commercial value that will be charged back against the franchise fee. Um, and bill inserts. Now, many people don't get mailers anymore, but it used to be that you could have like, bill inserts. That would be charged back because there's obviously a material value of some market. Um, cable drops to schools. <clears throat> I mean, the cable industry was built upon the idea, cable in the classroom was a project, a, a decades-long project to promote the cable industry for free and cable drops were put in every classroom. Well, suddenly you'd have to pay for every cable drop out of the franchise fee. Uh, INET, uh, INETs, maybe. Depends upon the agreement. Some INETs would be charged against the franchise fee, some would not. Um, fiber services from your location to their head end. That would certainly have a commercial cost that would be charged back. Um, uh, here's another one, uh, drops you have for live origination points. Many places will use 
some type of fiber back haul for, for live origination. That would be charged back. Here's one that the FCC doesn't preclude. The commercial value of the channel itself. You know, and I think in most markets, that alone, if a, if a cable operator was ballsy enough, would basically eviscerate franchise fees. I mean, certainly in the New York markets, where I just was, those four, four boroughs, imagine what those, you know, what a commercial channel would be in the New York market. Well, you know, Manhattan Neighborhood Network runs 12 of those. So, you know, take that value times 12 and then deduct it against your costs. Right? So it's a, it's, it's a mechanism to defund franchises administratively, in, when, in our, our view, in violation of the Cable Act. Okay. I mean, and it's curious. Um, uh, basically, you know, any non-monetary benefit could be charged back. What that fair market value is not clear. It's actually some discussion about using um, leased access costs, right? Because leased access channels exist under a different section of the Cable Act, and you know, commercial commercial vendors can buy can buy channel time. That's the reason why you see those, but exercising things on late night television, right? Um, the thing that's so clear about this is that that was never the intent of Congress when they wrote the act. Because they actually set up specific, a specific part of the act for leased access. There was never an intention that basically you would defund franchise fees. That it was always an intention that it would be the fair value of the use of land and public property for a license to make money, right? So that, the thing, the good news is that, is that Congress is not taking this lightly. Um, Senator Markey of Massachusetts, who was actually in the room where it happened, where he helped to write the, the Cable Act in 84 when he was in the House Energy and Commerce Committee, is organizing senators as we speak and actually will go public with a letter of disapproval that will be entered into the record um, on Monday. Um, and I can't give you the full list. A number of you, though, have been working with me and with our colleagues across the country to ask your senators to join in and sign, in, sign on that list. And, and because of the actions of ACM and our colleagues, we've gotten a good number of, of allies and actually we've actually built some some new friends in states like Michigan. Um, Senator Peters has been very supportive of, of the work that Senator Markey is doing. So this is actually a way for us to be building more momentum as, we, as this thing goes forward. Um, comments are gonna be due uh, in November. Initial comments from parties will be due in November. And then reply comments will be due in December, December 14th. Um, and then there will be uh, ex parte presentations in, in Washington with commissioners and with staff. And then I expect that an, uh, an order will come out sometime in the spring. And I would not predict that the order is going to be good for anybody. Um, so I can tell you that, that we're contemplating exactly how this violates law. And we're working with allies to think about the best way to defend your rights in um, a, uh, in a, 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 different, a different setting, in a courtroom. Okay, so that's part of what we're thinking about. For many of you who want to be involved with the, the proceeding, uh, ACM and NATOA have uh, put together a comment template. If you've never filed comments with the FCC, this is actually not a bad exercise to be involved with. We'll be filing comments, and our partners will be filing comments, but we want members to be involved. Now, I'm not expecting you to be making the legal arguments. Really, I think we want to be talking about the value of the work that you're doing and how you're, how you're actually fulfilling the spirit of the Cable Act through your work. Okay? We also have a sign-on letter that you could be using with your local electeds uh, that I can distribute to you. If you haven't gotten it already, it went out um, to ACM members uh, yesterday, I think, or the day before. Uh, it's a simp uh, simply a one-page template that you can adapt to talk about the instances in your community, because I can't do that as well as you can. But 
your mayor or your city council can use that to be able to sign on the record. We want that to be in the record that goes to the FCC. And actually, it would be good to send that to your congressional representatives too. And a lot of you actually have been asking your mayors to be involved and actually had your mayors talk to Congress and the Senate. Um, hey, Mike, can you just, what's the difference between comments and reply comments? So comments are initial, are initial so they'll, 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 you know, the order itself, when you look at the order, <clears throat> is probably 15 pages of, of facts, opinion about fact, and opinion about facts, and conclusions that the staff have come to. Um, so they'll ask questions. You know, is our conclusion that pigs can fly correct? We seek, we seek comment and statistics on this issue. You'll see that type of thing. So what happens is various players on the, on the proceeding will then comment on specific legal issues that are outlined or specific areas that are outlined. So for example, they actually detail uh, an, uh, an in-kind definition in the proceeding and they ask for comment on whether this is sustained by the Cable Act. Okay. First, first round comes out for different players. You have an opportunity to rebut or reply to what is in the record. That's what the reply comment round is. So you can go somewhere and read those initial comments. Right, this is all public. So you can go on the electronic comments, uh, comments filing system at the FCC. You can put in 05311, 05-311. You can see all the public comments that have been, all the records, all the public records. And it's all there for you to see. Now the, the issue for us as we make a legal case is we have to go with what's on the record. We can't just make stuff up. Right, so if there are facts on the ground that need to be presented from your communities, we want them to be entered into the record. That's why, and that, that's why that reply comment deadline is important. <clears throat> they will not, they, they will take comments after that deadline, but they will not consider them for their rulings. Now, under the Pi administration, it gets funnier, because he's a funny guy. Uh, <laughs> It's not clear to me that they actually read the public's comments at all. In the net neutrality proceeding that they had, there's some, uh, they basically said, well, we don't read the public. We just wanted to have like the professionals uh, take. So, so, I, I, so I would say, just I'll get to the second period. So you're a professional, please comment, okay? Right? I, don't know that, I don't know that generating a lot of comments from your viewers helps. But you taking the information from your viewers for your comments helps, right? So uh, there's a, a, we have a colleague right now that's generating a bunch of comments. If you go into the proceeding, you'll see something, and that's a lot of, we, you know, it's a lot of individuals, and they won't read that stuff. If it's coming from you as a representative of the local franchising authority, and you've engaged your community for what their needs are, that has a different weight. Yeah? So do you make those comments through the FCC website? Yes. And, and yes. So yeah, I mean, and, and typically what you'll do is you, you'll create a PDF of a letter. Okay. So basically I've got a form letter that you can adopt. Okay. Okay. Create a PDF, you, you, you upload the PDF to the site and you give contact information so you get confirmation that it's been, that, but once it's put to the FCC website, that's all public. So please don't say anything you want to say only in private. It's all public, right? Yeah. I mean, maybe people ask me that question, right? Uh, but I've got materials you can use in the next, the next 35, 45 days. Really, the deadline you should be thinking about is December 14th for this. You can still, you can still file comments after that com comment deadline, uh, especially if it's from elected officials or it's you know, replying to something that's in the record. Any questions so far on this? I yeah. I still have another question. So our community, well, one of them, on Thursday signed um, a resolution, their entire board, and they're sending it to Mike Watsa. Is that going to those comments? Uh, my guess is, is that Wa Mike Watsa, who's a, uh, an attorney who's a friend, is probably working on behalf of, your, uh, yeah. behalf of the, the township. My guess is, as their, rep as their attorney, he'll file the comments for them. 
He'll probably file those on behalf of the Cable Commission. That would be my guess. He will. That is correct. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, in, If your commission, if if your commission is filed, that's that should be good. But you probably want to check those comments and make sure that the, they they reflect the record of what you want to represent, right? Yeah. Um, that pro so I mean, you you may not need to have comments if your commission has filed comments, your mic. You may not in this docket. You might want to double check that it's this docket. All right. But certainly the elected officials in the community should be involved, right? Um, I had another question about this with uh, some of the senators that we've been reaching out to on this uh, rulemaking. Uh, a number of them are supportive but haven't been involved because they've been on the campaign trail. They're running for re-election. Um, so there's probably another bite at the apple to reach out to them for support. So my suggestion would be to reach out to them when they're really happy on November 7th, okay? And they won't, they won't have the, the, logistic, the logistic reasons that they're, that they're talking about for not putting something in the record. That deadline of 1214 is after the election, okay? So promise to talk to staff after the election, but then talk to them immediately. Don't wait till the 13th. Alyssa. So just Should she still get the public comments as a professional and file those? I don't know if it's necessary for your community. Okay. My, my, uh, I mean, I respect Mike's work a great deal. Mm -hmm. um, just not every community has that level of representation. Right, right, right. That's, that's, all, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. But I think you probably just want to be in contact with them to make sure that they're, they're reflecting the reality on the ground in terms of what the community, community media needs are, right. right, and also what the effect of this would be on franchise fees as well as on the channels. The, the effect that this has is, I think, uh, if it goes through and it's, and it's supported, is that it basically means that a community has to choose between franchise fees or channels. Which is not the intention of the Cable Act. Just to be, just, right? And what, I think what you're seeing is you're seeing an, a, an, a, an administrative action that's happening because they can't get stuff passed through Congress. So just keep thinking that, that, that that's what's happening, right? Is that like they use administrative proceedings to be able to reach certain ends and then you've got congressional work to reach other ends, right? But they'll never give up. So I've talked to some people who say, oh my God, this is really depressing. I said, yes, it's like, again, it's like getting a flu shot every year. I'm sorry. You're 55. You're going to have a flu shot for the rest of your life, right? Sorry. Sorry. We have to battle to ensure that the public goods that we see every day exist in the future. Sorry. Get that flu shot. Here's another FCC proceeding ACN's been, ACN's been acting, uh, active on. Any other questions on the FMPRM, by the way? Go ahead, Jim. As far as states that have state franchising, there's, what's the, is there a difference? Nope, no difference at all. Uh, our, our friend Mike O'Reilly, the uh, uh, FCC uh, commissioner, uh, wants to do you a favor. And he said that uh, this question should be applied, can this question be applied to, to uh, states with state franchising? Since, you know, you pernicious, awful local government I mean, he basically, he basically has the idea that somehow local governments create crimes every day, and because local governments employ cops, they don't actually arrest the local governments themselves, right? It's kind of, he has only, have, obviously hasn't been to Fall River, Massachusetts, but anyway, that's a, that's a different story. It's an access joke that I won't get too far into. Um, um, so, I mean, he specifically asked the question, you know, why can't we apply this to all states? And the thing that's really crazy is the, the rationale for this. The rationale for this is broadband investment. Right? Because we know, of course, that if they, you know, if the peg fee 
or the franchise fee that supports community channels disappears, it's going to go for broadband investment. Of course. Not for executive compensation, certainly. It would never go to executives. Never. It would never go for mergers and acquisitions. Never. It would help rural communities. They're not being served well. We all know that. Okay, let's go to something that's a little less, little less uh, brings a little less uh, irony forward. Although there is irony in this one as well. <laughs> uh, this is the second report in order in, on closed captioning, which occurred in 2016. Uh, docket 05231. You notice these docket numbers, those are the years that the docket was open. So this is like an open docket that's been going for 13 years now. Uh, the FCC in this uh, basically determined the responsibility for captioning a video on all television channels across the United States. They said that <clears throat> captioning uh, uh, would be uh, the responsibility of all video producers. All video producers on all channels of all types Captioning is the responsibility, not of the cable channel, not of the network channel, but the producer. Great thing, wonderful thing. They've determined who, who's responsible for captioning. It then also set up a reporting system for consumer complaints. So that every, every producer and every channel would have a point of contact with the federal government. And if a complaint came in, you'd find out about it. That's actually a good thing. Right? right now, if you're running a cable channel, let's say we're, we're talking about uh, your channels in, in Carmel, um, you don't know about a complaint unless they call you directly. If a complaint goes to the FCC, it doesn't go back to you. It may go to the cable company, but it doesn't go back to you, the, the channel originator. So they were going to set up basically what would be in, uh, this registration system for all, all video producers and all cable channels in the United States. Uh, they issued the order, uh, they took initial comments in 2011, before I took my job. <laughs> uh, they, they made the order in 2016. Um, and when I read the order in February 2016, I gave them a call and I said, so this is great. Uh, you're going to have every public access producer in America register with you. Do you see a problem with that? <laughs> you know? I mean, we have a hard time enough administering camera checkouts, right? How are you going to be the cop on the job with every gospel, every gospel group in America that rents cameras? How are you going to police the Girl Scout troop that comes in to produce a program on their spring break to get their badge, their merit badge? Because under your definitions, they're video producers that are responsible for the registration system alone. They may be exempt from captioning requirements. But they have to register. And they have to file a yearly report. <laughs> um, they agreed that that was a problem. And they're reasonable folks because they did not want their databases to be littered with, you know, Cub Scout troops and gospel organizations and uh, you know, other, other folks that use public access channels. They told me specifically that they assumed that everybody who owned a channel was the producer of the program. But that's the model that they were using as they were thinking about this. They're also thinking that it's a corporate entity with a legal department that files paperwork, right? And, you know, S S Timmy the Cub Scout and Sally the Girl Scout do not have their own legal department, <laughs> right? So we, they, they suggested in 2016, under then FCC com, uh, Chairman Tom Wheeler, <laughs> wait for it, wait for it, uh, that we should file a petition asking for a waiver. We filed a petition. There was a public comment period that occurred then in 2017. Um, and everyone agreed with us that, no, we do not want Cub Scouts to register with the federal government to be able to use cameras in Carmel, Indiana. Right? We don't. You're welcome. I'm, I'm, on the, I'm on your case. I'm working for you. However, however, a new chairman intervened and said, oh, I do not like 
conditions for waiver, I would like to make, do a rulemaking. So they are going to set up a further notice of proposed rulemaking on this question. And they're kicking the can down the road. So the good news is that everyone agrees with the position that we've outlined with the FCC, which is that if, if a channel has an exemption, like peg channels do under their rules for captioning, the producers have an exemption. Right? And they don't want the, they do not want public access producers to register. A channel would still register. You'd have a point of contact for any consumer complaints. And we didn't think that was too onerous, because that's like a 10 minute process. My name, my address, email, phone number, reason for self, ex reason for exemption. <clears throat> and then you have the benefit of getting the complaint. Um, the other thing that's happened is that because of our, our order, our petition, uh, they have not set up the registration system. And the registration system had a July 1st deadline that they blew through in 2016, they've blown through in 2017, they blew through in 2018, and I could start a bet, let's start a, let's start a pool tonight. Let's all put like a dollar in. And let's put like the, the date, the year when the exemption system comes forward, the registration system comes forward. My guess is, is that they will not make 2019. They'll have to go through the rulemaking first. They'll have to issue an order. Then they'll have to appropriate budget to create the system. So they have to probably go through a budgetary cycle. So um, my sense is this may live in the next presidential administration. They may not get to this in this, this, this administration. Good news, bad news. Any questions on this one? I told you there would be some irony here. Okay, all right. Let's get to a couple of court cases uh, that, that are, are interesting. You probably don't need to monitor these very closely, but they're interesting. They, they, do, they do affect you. Um, one actually that's got a lot of effect I'll talk about in a minute. This is a court case, the Comcast versus the Vermont Public Utilities Commission. It's going on right now in U.S. District Court in Vermont. Um, it's an interesting background of the case. It's challenging, um, Comcast is challenging the findings of the Vermont PUC. Uh, Vermont is a state franchising state. It's only got 600,000 people in a pretty rural, rural set of communities. Um, so the state PUC is the, the franchising authority. And then they set up a certificate of public good with the cable company. And then they instruct the cable company to enter into uh, agreements with access management organizations at the local level. It's a very different form of, of administration. So, you know, the, of the, I think it's like 26 or 27 uh, access organizations um, in Vermont, the majority of them, I think 24, are, are Comcast stations. Uh, the rest of them are chartered. Um, uh, as the PUC went through the refranchising process for the Certificate of Public Good with, with Comcast. Uh, it found Comcast to be negligent um, in terms of its commitments to uh, providing uh, uh, facility support to provide about 550 miles of communities that were not being served. So it ordered line extensions of 550 miles in the state, which is a substantial amount in a small state like Vermont, when you think about it. Um, and then they also ordered that, that Comcast was in violation of uh, electronic program guide uh, insertion requirements from an earlier certificate of public good. And they had to make good on what had been an earlier commitment to having all the channels on the electronic program guide at the program level. Um, and then they said in their, their order that they would revisit HD channels for all of the Comcast systems as well in a two-year period of time. Um, Comcast basically fought the, fought the uh, case on a number of, a number of uh, 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 for a number of reasons, um, one of which was that their First Amendment rights as a publisher were being violated. And to our, to our benefit, the district court kicked out that, that claim. He said, no, no, your rights as a publisher do not supersede the rights of the channels to exist. 
successors. A good, a good decision that occurred. The case is still ongoing, hasn't been settled. Um, and my guess is, is that if, if Comcast gets an adverse uh, ruling in this case, they'll probably appeal it to the Supreme Court. Okay. Um, I, I think they, they just want to outspend Vermont and not invest the money to be able to do their mediation that they should have done in 2006. They had an obligation that went back more than 10 years. And they actually invested in a system that made it impossible to do electronic program guide insertion from those access management organizations. So they claimed it would be an, an impossible business expense. The commission said, no, you knew the obligation when you bought the system. And you willingly violated your obligations by changing your business practices. You need to fulfill your public obligation. So that's an interesting case. Something to, to, just to be, from, a, just from monitoring, it, 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 it probably will not affect you directly, but it's an indi has indirect effects in terms of public obligations questions. What's this say about Comcast, the way they're? Um, it says that they have a lot of money. Um, they, they have the ability to do a multi-year process and to, you know, sue. I mean, I mean, the order came out in 2017, so it's now been in federal court for 18 months. So they have the ability to pay a legal department for 18 months at least. It'll probably go another six or eight months. So they're making the bet that they'll pay their pay their legal staff X amount of money to, to be up in the district court rather than actually investing in the community. And as I mentioned earlier, they had $40 billion in cash lying around to buy Sky TV. $40 billion? Billion, with a B, with a B. So, I mean, so it's curious. I mean, the Vermont PUC is pretty clear about this. It's like, they care about localism. And they're saying, no, you need to invest in the local community. You're making enough money. Do and you can't make the claim, you can't make the claim that, you know, by uh, paying for your past bad acts, Vermont customers will suffer, right? So the, the PUC is actually very strong on this, this, this case. Um, and they worked hand in hand with uh, the Vermont Access Organizations that worked as an, a, an intervening agency. Because the, the Access Organizations are not, are not litigants in the case, they're, they're, they're interveners to help with the public record. So you can, I mean, factually they have a lot of money. You can make, I'm not gonna give you, give you a value judgment on that. I, I kind of admire it, but anyway. This case actually probably does concern you. This is a case that the US Supreme Court has agreed to take. Uh, oh, this is flipped around. It should be Manhattan Community Access Corporation versus Halleck. Halleck versus MCAC was the original district court case. When we were putting the slide together, Jim Horwood from Spiegel and McDermott and I uh, did not know that the Supreme Court would take the case. Uh, literally seconds after we, we talked about this in Schenectady, they agreed to take the case. So it's Manhattan Community Access Corporation versus Halleck. Um, the Supreme Court, uh, the, the Roberts Kavanaugh Court, if I can call it that, uh, the 5-4 majority is, will be hearing this case. And I don't know that there are good implications for anyone in this case. Here's some background on it. Um, uh, there was a dispute between Dee Dee Halleck, who's an access producer in Manhattan, and the public access provider, the third party entity that the city of New York designates to operate the channels, Manhattan. In this case, it's called Manhattan Neighborhood Network. The corporate name is Manhattan Community Access Corp. I'm not gonna get into the, the, the facts of the dispute, <clears throat> um, but program was removed from the channel um, during the course of uh, a, a board meeting. Um, uh, Dee Dee was asked to not tape board members without their consent. And she claimed that they were, as a public corporation, were subject to being taped without their consent. Okay. Um, she was subsequently given, a, I think, a, a, a one-year ban and her production partner was given a lifetime ban because of state, purportedly, for, because of alleged statements that he had made threatening the health 
um, uh, of, of staff members, okay? Right, I mean, it was, a, it was a claim of assault. Now, I don't know the facts of the case. In the course of suing Dee Dee, Dee, Dee and her pr uh, production partner, um, uh, Papalona Menendez, uh, then sued the city of New York, as well as, Ma as, well as Manhattan C Community Access Corporation, saying that their First Amendment rights have been violated. And further, that it's a public forum, that the, that the, the operations of the organization are a public forum, and she should be given the opportunity to tape people and tape board members in, in an, in, without the consent. Um, MNN takes the position that no, um, uh, the city of New York takes the position, it's not our, we're not involved. It's the Access Corporation that runs the channels. We're not involved at all. Don't sue us. District Court agreed. Um, she lost the initial suit against MNN. MNN said that they are a private corporation and they were not a state actor and therefore their board meetings aren't, aren't public under, state, under New York state law. I don't know if that's the case or not. I don't know New York, New York open meeting law. And I think this is the thing that's important to recognize in this. Each state treats private nonprofits differently. And I think this gets confused in a lot of this discussion. Right? So Dee Dee loses in, on, in, the, in the initial court, uh, appeals to the circuit court, the second circuit court, and wins against MNN in the Second Circuit Court. Second Circuit Court says that public access channels per se are public forum. Therefore, those organizations that operate them are state actors. And then remands the case to a lower court so that the, the suit can be settled, can be figured out. Because you have to remember that this is about the damages involved and, and the dispute between the organization. Right? So this entire question of like, sort of like, what, is the ch what are the channels becomes sort of the football that they're fighting about. But there's a different s dispute. And th the Second Circuit Court says, okay, we'll remand this back to a lower court to adjudicate the dispute. Manhattan, Manhattan Neighborhood Network then appeals to the, su the Supreme Court saying, um, no, we're a private actor and we should not be treated as a state actor. And this is the thing that's curious about this. The case law is really not very good in any, in any case on this one. And as I talk with people, just from a sort of a common understanding, they would say that the channels that we operate are public forums. But depending upon the organization that operates it, sometimes it's a state actor, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's the city of Ann Arbor, which is a public actor. Sometimes it's a private corporation that's a, that contracts for it. Sometimes it's the cable company. So there's, 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 a, there's a gray area that, need, that, that, that unfortunately the Supreme Court has to deal with now, is what is the nature of these channels and what are the nature of private organizations that operate these channels? The fear that some of us have is that, the, is that the conservative majority will find a way to use this as a forum to accept the type of argument that came from Comcast in the Vermont suit. That the channels violate their First Amendment rights because it's a taking of their private property. And at that point, I'm friends, Franchise fees aren't the thing you should be worrying about. At that point, the channels themselves disappear because the, they would find the cable. And I don't know if this case will do it, but it opens the door for a challenge of the Cable Act. That's the fear that a lot of us have. So we're trying to figure out how to, how to navigate this. ACM is going to work as an amicus on this case. Uh, I've been in talks with both of the parties. I've, I, I ruined my Hawaiian vacation talking to the two of them. <laughs> Uh, long distance, right? 
Uh, I can tell you this. I mean, at one point, I had gotten MNN to agree to drop the suit if Didi would drop the initial complaint. And Didi would not drop the initial complaint. Why wouldn't she drop the initial complaint? Because she needed to have discovery, meaning she wants to rake MNN over the coals before a court in terms of how they operate. So this is not, this is not about this. This is a dispute between two parties that do not get along. Right? There are some principles here that we need to be attending to and be concentrating on. And the challenge that ACM has as we look at this is that there's the, the, the court record about how, how public fora are, are handled, like shopping centers, where you put up bulletin board information, uh, protests in parks, that type of law is very different from what a lot of us think about when we think about telecom law. And then trying to figure out exactly how our organizations in all their variety fit within the Supreme Court ruling is very difficult. I will tell you, you know, um, this is going to be an ugly case regardless. I, I, I prefer not to bring up the dead. I prefer to fight for the living. Um, if, I can, if I can paraphrase someone, someone who's dead. Um, <laughs> uh, um, uh, but I, I, you know, uh, I, you know, I think so. The, the, I mean, so I, you know, I think if you talk to most people, they say in our field, they'll say a public access channel is a public forum. And you can, and you can regulate it in time, place, and manner as to where, where program content goes, right? You don't have to air the same damn thing over and over and over again. You can put it out at 10 p.m. at night, air it once, et cetera. And you can actually ask producers to disclose what's in the content without pre-screening the content. What's the program type? Oh, it's nude wrestling? Okay, we'll put it on the nude wrestling slot, which is at 2 a.m. on Saturday, Saturday mornings, right? As opposed to, oh, we'll put it on the youth channel. Right? You're allowed to do that because you can manage a public forum for, in terms of time, place, and manner of speech. That's a common understanding that we have in our field. Um, in talking with, and just to be clear, in talking with MNN, and that's a typo, it's not MNN, MNN, um, in talking with MNN, their concern is that as a private corporation, they will be deemed to be the state government, the local government. And that causes them a whole host of other problems. And I'm really sympathetic to that as well. And the problem is it's now in the hands of five white guys. I'm seeing some hands pop up. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm going to try to phrase this question a little bit. Um, so, like, the business press stories about this tend to focus on what they think the implications might be for social media as a public forum. And I'm just curious if you think that there's a aspect where the Supreme Court will steer this as an attempt to try to handle public forum in those ways, and then what happens to us will be the uh, side effect? Well, or if you think they're going to be doing this mostly as a corporatist? Oh, it's, cur it's curious. So like a Twitter or Facebook will say that they are not a public forum. Yeah. Um, and that they have the ability to have editorial privileges on content. That's why Twitter can basically get, you know, can can manage trolls in a certain way. And they're not leaving because of what I just said. They had to go. Uh, Daniel's question drove them out. Um, okay, now we can talk about them. Now we can talk about them. Um, so, there, so, so that's, one, that's one theory of the case. I think, I, think the reason, I think the reason why they took it is the entire question of, of a private, private property and public speech rights. Because those are the cases that they kind of come to over, the conservative majority comes to over and over again. I think that's the reason why I took it. How that would work with like a Twitter and like the, the, uh, the, 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 the public forum argument that occurred with the president's Twitter feed, I have no clue actually. Because in that instance, I don't know what Twitter would say. I really don't. Um, but in that case, they said that the president's feed was like a public forum because he was a state actor. Well, he is, he is a state actor. They say 
as opposed to the forum, as opposed to the forum being created by the state actor. There, the state actor creates the public forum, right? I don't know. I don't know. I, and it'd be really fair. I, this is not my specialty yeah. of law. I, I mean, I, I know about how everybody in our field works. I don't. I'm not really strong. My personal. I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not really conversant in public actor theory, and, that, and, and public speech theory. So that's a that's a. That's another sort of concern we've got as we're kind of moving forward in this. Randy, you're going to say. Does the show political speech, or is it something that could be defined as objectionable to prurient interest of Manhattan? Uh, it wasn't prurient. It wasn't prurient. It was uh, Didi's show. Basically, was a was a program against MNN. Uh, it was it was it was <clears throat> it was meant to embarrass the organization as they were opening up their satellite studio in East Harlem. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I think the, the 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 speech claim there's a speech claim that the the court needs to adjudicate, where her co-producer threatens violence against the staff, but but that's that's a that's a you know that's a that's a, that's the subject of like that's a subject of adjudication, right? So, so I mean I mean they pulled they pulled him as a producer because of that threat of violence now. Do you have the right to do that as a private organization? Probably you do. Sure. Right? That, that's different. I mean, to me, that's a completely different issue. But are they, I mean, they, you know, they're one of the older access centers in the country. It's, it's where a lot of this, I mean, how does this a organization with access in their name, you know, justify that? Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not well, I, 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 okay, so to be fair, I mean, I, I, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to say the same thing I said to Dee Dee when she, yeah. Try to adjudicate this before the Schenectady right. crowd. The MNN is not here to defend themselves. Program air. The program air. Oh, cool. She can, apparently she can, she is not banned from the facility. She can produce any time. Okay. He's banned because of the threat of violence. Okay. Right? She thinks, she says BS. She claims that's all made up. And, and that's and that's the whole thing in the toilet. Yes. The whole yes. 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 <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. 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 New York is Dee Dee had that attitude on day one. Right. I mean, and she said, "Why am I the villain?" Well, it's because you're trying to basically you try to turn everybody's business into your own business. Right. I mean, and she says she. I mean, she says she is saving public access for her. She says that she understands the consequences. I am not sure she understands the consequences. We've, we've outlined the danger to her. Uh, I don't know that her attorney disagrees. Who's paying for all this? Is Dee got a bunch of I don't know. Uh, she's getting pro bono support. Um, and, and, you know, she sued, she sued Eminem. So God bless media liability insurance. It's the media liability insurance is paying for the defense. Right? So you can't even say the cable, the cable revenue, the, the franchise fees support is—it's not involved at this point. So I mean, we've been trying to get them to stop this for years. Uh, I tried to get them to pull back in August. That's your in-kind contribution. Yeah. <laughs> That's the value of that. I wish I wish there was a monetary value for like my sweet life that I can't get back. Right? <laughs> uh, anyway, we're gonna file an amicus case, amicus brief. Uh, on behalf of our members. You don't have to do that. We'll consult with you on this ahead of time, but know that we want to make sure that we try to respect the diversity of our industry. And that's the problem with this. It's like it's trying to take New York rules and have them go to everywhere. And like public access has to be the, this way, and we think that that's even wrong. Right? I mean, we want to limit the damage if we can with this. I think there's an argument to be made that there's a New York case and it should be adjudicated within a New York forum, yeah. right? Because otherwise it's a possible extinction event. Well, right, and, and I think there's, a, there's also, I mean, it's interesting, under New York law, theoretically the Public Service Commission would hear a complaint. It's not clear whether or not the complaint was ever filed. So, I mean, we're trying to figure it out. Monitor this one. This one, this one could be bad. And then also be careful on this one because a lot of people use this as a platform to beat their breast and talk about how they're saving public access or how dare they do this or how dare they do that. Well, 
you know. This happens when organizations uh, and producers don't work together. Where's the empathy? Well, we need to, build, we need to be building empathy, yeah, don't we? I think we do. I, I don't think that's a legal argument before the <laughs> Kavanaugh court, but yes. I, I, I somehow think after, after the Kavanaugh confirmation hearings that empathy is not going to be, not going to be a, a legal standard. Go ahead. Just so I'm clear, if the Supreme Court does not grant the writ. It, it, the, writ was grant, the, writ, the writ was grant, the writ was grant, I, I, I beg your pardon. This is a little old. This is two weeks old. The writ was granted. A, br a brief will, MNN will file a brief in 30 days. Amicus briefs will be due 45 days after that. It'll probably be heard in the Supreme Court sometime this spring. So I, I hear that DC is lovely in the spring. <laughs> Cherry blossom season and Supreme Court cases. Go ahead. Uh, what constitutional principle do you think the Supreme Court will then settle as the guiding principle? Not clear. It's not clear. It's not clear. I mean, so so first, first, they could say this is a New York issue and and say, you know, beat it back. They could they could agree with part of the uh, with part of the uh, the ruling in the Second Circuit Court and say, yes, the case needs to be heard under New York rules. They could say, oh, the New York rules were not abided by, the case is thrown out. They could vacate the Second Circuit's ruling in its entirety and say, no, it's not, not a public actor, and no, I mean, no, it's not a public forum, and no, it's not a state actor. I think that might be how they go because of the majority. They could also then open the door and say, oh, and, you know, government should not be inducing free speech. We think the Cable Act is unconstitutional. <laughs> and then, you know, and then, well, uh, <laughs> I, 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 you know, it, it uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I mean, this is a this is a consistent. I mean, this is a consistent thing that pops up in the conservative court is the question of whether or not free speech can be induced by, uh, or a public obligation can be put on a private actor. The private actor in this case is not MNN, it's the cable company. Because MNN does not own the cable channels, the cable company does. Yep, that's right. right, and they're a designated entity under the local franchise agreement. So there's this sort of theory that goes, okay, if they're not a state actor, why are they given channels? So maybe we just see that public access disappears and it's just uh, like, uh, educational and government access at that point. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, so I, 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 I just, there's a lot at stake on this one. Uh, that's all. all right. and, and then this one, uh, real quickly, this is a fee on fee question. This is a case that we're, we're in amicus in in district court in California. Um, Basically, the district held, court held that uh, in Sacramento, Comcast cannot deduct uh, administrative fees uh, off of franchise fees. Okay. Um, so this is like a fee on fee issue um, that would reduce the franchise fee obligation in Sacramento uh, because the state public service commission or public utilities commission in, in California actually administers a fee uh, requirement on the cable company as well. So this is actually being adjudicated right now and another, another Comcast case being adjudicated. Oral arguments are going to be happening in California in December. Uh, this, if you're not in California, this could affect you, uh, particularly if there are administrative fees that uh, are required beyond your franchise. Um, do we see that in some states? Massachusetts has something like that. Um, and then there's this question of sort of fee on fee issue that pops up for the, like, what the gross, the gross amount is. Steve. So Ohio, we found out after the franchise went in, uh, that went back into legislation we didn't know about, letting the cable company deduct the fee that they had to pay the state. Yeah, the that's this issue. That is this issue. We didn't even know, it wasn't in the original bill. Somehow later, six months, a year later, they got a bill through that said, oh yeah, do this. So if you need to justify your ACM membership, let them know that, that we're on working, on working on your behalf, okay? Because cool. uh, that, I mean, cause that's, that's literally the issue here in Sacramento, right? Okay. 
and that's me, that's my direct number, and that's my office in Minneapolis. I'm based in DC, uh, Twitter handles, and then uh, uh, updates on ACM at the uh, website, just in case people need to get a hold of me. And if people want copies of this, please let me know, and I'm happy to give you a copy of it, all right? Any other questions? Like how I stay so perky? <laughs> <laughs> Dealing with this nonsense. Right. Go ahead. So I have a question. You talked about um, digital guide information and things like that. Yeah. We are having a hell of a time right now with our, we're our charter channel. Yeah. And they are not giving us our digital guide information. Are you a, are, is it a, are you a local franchise state or a state franchise state? We're a we're state. You're a state franchise state. My guess is, is there's no requirement in the state franchise for that. There is guide information that they put out, but it's not us. It's random information. On your channel? Yeah, like if you go to our channel, we're channel 1021, there will be a guide information, but it's not anything related to us. What is the... So, so are, you asking, are you asking that they... We're asking that they either take the guide information off altogether so that it doesn't confuse residents. Correct. Or just have a general community access guide. What, um, they, they told us they would do two years ago. We paid twenty-seven thousand dollars for them to upgrade our transmission equipment. All right. And they said that that was one of the things that they were doing, and then they never did it. And every time. Did they put it in writing? I was not a part of the original agreement. But did they put it in writing? I don't know. I oh. never saw the original agreement. Okay. So that's the that's, that's the first thing I always say is well, what's in writing. Right. I mean, so you may have a course of action against them, but it, you'd have to have some sort of issue about a promise made in writing. Every time we talk right? to them now, they say that there's no way that they can do that because they subcontract that out. So oh, no in Kansas City. quack, quack, quack. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the, that's nonsensical. All, all cable companies subcontract out those data services. What they typically do is have a, uh, an agreement with the subcontractor. Uh, I don't know if it, who, if it's Rovi or, or if it's, it's, it's Tribune. It's Tribune. It's, yeah, it's the Tribune um, media. Um, y you could talk with Tribune tomorrow, and you could give them all your data. And actually, Tribune would publish it online for you. They'd be happy to do it. Okay. Um, do you think it'd be better to go straight to them? Right? I think the first, first thing is you need to talk to Tribune. Okay. Set up, set up a procedure for you, to talk, for you to be able to get your data to them appropriately. So they'll, ha they'll have a lot a data form. They probably, I think, I know that they'll ha they actually have a, employees that do this work with cable channels all the time, including local ch cable channels, because they actually want people to watch channels, right? Theoretically, you could use that data in other devices, right? I mean, if you had like an OTT device, that data could go to that, or it could be published online, or any of any of other places. Start with Tribune. Figure the facts on the ground. If that is their, the subcontractor, come go back, go back to Charter. So you have no, you know, it's a turnkey solution at this point. There's no reason why you can't do it. And, and then it's got the issue of multiple uh, access channels using the same channel number. If that's the case in Ohio, it's conceivable. It's conceivable based upon what their MSO, what their, what the, what their, what their uh, head end is, is, how their head end is configured. But even that. The head end for our city is at the community access channel in the next city. Okay. But even that can be, can, you know, that can be engineered. I mean, I think that the issue ends up being um, you want your viewers to see this so that they can actually take advantage of it. Yeah, I mean, people. And when they scroll through, they don't know what that means because that has nothing to do with, with our community. Right. So in the Vermont case, here, the Vermont organizations in the state said this is necessary for modern use of television. The data is necessary. Viewers expect it. And viewership declines if you don't use it. So therefore, not having it under, undermines the reason why the channels exist now. That may be why Charter isn't doing their work. I'm not saying that. A cynic would say that. I'm a happy man. I, I, I'm optimist. I'm optimist, but I would check with Tribune first to know precisely the mechanics of the issue and make sure that it conforms with your, your, your transmission to try to make that as easy as possible. I mean, we're not even asking for our day-to-day -day guidance, but we just wanted to say, like, Hudson Community Access Channel or something. Right. That's all we want 
Right. right. I mean, and actually, that's something that they could, they could do tomorrow, probably. Okay. I, 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 yeah. I argued with them for years and years because there's two things. When, the, when you turn the channel, you get an ID. Mm -hmm. That's what you want changed. It's not just the program guy. And yeah, I finally got, they, they were arguing right. for years, they couldn't do it technically. They couldn't do it technically. But then I saw it show up elsewhere when yeah. they changed. They finally agreed they would change my channel, not the other public access channels, and then they spelled us wrong. Better than what it was. So anyway, I thank you guys for taking the time. Um, I hope, hopefully this was useful. Um, please you know, let me know if there's ways that I can help you understand things. Flipping it around for me to do my work well in Washington, I need people on the ground in communities that can tell their stories well and are passionate about their work. So thank you for their work and for working with me uh, in Alliance. In Alliance. Uh, in Alliance. There you go. So yeah. thank you. I really Alliance. appreciate it, guys. Yeah. Being yeah. Mike. Clap, clap, clap.